So, eternal security. What about point 23? Nothing can separate the believer from the love which is in Christ Jesus. To get in Christ Jesus and experience his love and all the other things that happen, 50 some odd things, more than that, uh, you just choose to believe. When you chose to believe, you become a believer. And then thereafter it says, For I am convinced, Paul says, I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now I've had people say ridiculous things like, well, yeah, but if you sin, but you don't repent enough, you're still going to go to hell, but just God will just love you in hell. No, you separate us from the experience of uh, agape and emotional love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You can't get out of Christ Jesus and you can't be separated from the love of God. But there will always be somebody who will argue something ridiculous. Go back to normative rules of language, context, and logic. And carefully prepare yourself ahead of time for these questions. Number 24. The work of Jesus Christ in heaven now, as the believer's advocate, assures his eternal destiny. He's your advocate in heaven. Is he going to be a failing advocate? No, because he's already paid the penalty for your sins. You do some sins, more sins, they're paid for, past, present, and future. And you're completely forgiven because you believed. What better can you have as an advocate? 1 John 2, 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. I paid for that sin, Jesus says. And I've forgiven him for that by faith alone. Hebrews 9.24 For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God. For whom? For us. He's our advocate. Point 25. Jesus Christ is now in heaven, interceding in the believer's behalf to preserve him in salvation. It's kind of like a corollary of the previous one, number 24. Romans 8, 34a, Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. He takes upon himself the sins of the whole world, and he takes it seriously, and intercedes for us, moment by moment by moment. Hebrews 7, 23 to 25, and the former priests, on the one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. They're human priests. But he, Christ, on the other hand, because he abides forever, holds his priesthood permanently. But what in for us? Let's see. Hence also he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He drew near to God through Christ by believing in Christ's sacrifice for your sins. That's the gospel. Point 26, there is only one baptism of the believer, which is by the Holy Spirit into Christ, which is not taught in Scripture as a temporary act, which could be undone and then repeated if salvation was lost and then regained. Are you bigger than the Holy Spirit? 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, all mankind of accountable age that believes. And we were all made to drink of one spirit when we believe. Ephesians 4, 5, there is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. So one Lord, one faith, one baptism. It's not water baptism. You're going to kick the Holy Spirit out and, and let substitute for water? It's Holy Spirit baptism that saves. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all in, and in all. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. You believe in Jesus Christ, Ephesians 1, 13 to 14, and you're placed into Christ by virtue of the Holy Spirit baptism. The old things passed away, behold, new things have come. We can't get unnew. Point 27. God cannot deny himself nor his promise of eternal life who indwells the believer, the Holy Spirit, 
and dwells the believer unto eternal life, and that forever. 2 Timothy 2, 11 to 13. Here is a trustworthy saying, For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. For if we died him with him, we will also live with him. That phrase, if by faith we become sharers in the death of Christ, then we also will also share in his eternal life. We look at Romans 3, 21 to 24, 6, 1 to 16, and Galatians 3, 1 to 3. Here is Galatians 3, 1 to 3 right here. If, if then you have been raised up with Christ, if then you were raised up with Christ at the point of trusting in him for eternal life, Romans 6, 1 to 10. If then you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things that are on earth. Set your mind on the things above. Not on the things that are on earth. For you have died with Christ, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So if we died with Christ, we were saved unto eternal life. If we died with Christ, which is by faith alone in Christ alone, then we will live with him forever. If we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit in us, which we did at the point of faith, which is our identification with the death of Christ and its benefits, then we will also live with him. And that's it, meaning since. So, if we endure, we shall also reign with him. Okay, you're going to be in eternal life, in residence in heaven. But what if we endure in the faith? We shall then also reign with him. So, if we who are believers, who are, so, who are secure in our eternal life, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, endure the difficulties and testing us and live a faithful, productive life full of divine good production, if we endure, we shall also reign with him. So, if we endure, we endure as endure is defined above, then we believers will not only have eternal life with Jesus Christ in heaven because our, of our one-time expression of faith in him, but we'll also reign, in other words, co-rule with him and receive unimaginably glorious rewards. You know, sometimes you get a gift, a static gift. Other times you give a gift of a responsibility that you're fully capable of fulfilling. What a joy that is to have your life worth something. And what a great joy it is in eternity that God gives you the capacity and then allows you, appoints you to rewards and reigning with him. Compare Romans 8, 16 to 17. The spirit himself with our spirit, with our spirit, we are our children, God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-rule and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Our own particular suffering issues. The more you're faithful, the more you face our difficulties. Now if we believers are children, then we are heirs of God unto eternal life in heaven, and not only heirs of eternal life in heaven, but if we are faithful, as as the rest of this verse states, then we are co-heirs or co-inheritors of rulership with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings by taking up our own cross, Matthew 16, 24 to 27, in order that we may also share in his glory. So it is those believers who take up their cross and follow Christ who will reign with him. Indeed, those who endure by remaining faithful, by abiding in Christ, by producing fruit, will also suffer their own peculiar suffering during their lifetime for the sake of Christ. Those believers who do not abide in Christ will not inherit much in heaven, if at all, but they will get there. When they get there, they won't see much inheritance coming for them. Hey, wooden stubble instead of gold, silver, and precious stones. So, Timothy says, if we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we disown him, we will also he will also disown us, disinherit us. He will also disown us, disinherit us. If we believers disown us, we disavow Christ's ownership of us by acting in thought, word, and deed, in disobedience and unfaithfulness, and deny him, well, I'm, you know, you're not going to stand up and be counted as a Christian and answer to some of the objections people have. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 corroborate this. So then Christ, if our, we disown him, will disown our ownership, our, our inheritance of eternal rewards and co-rulership with him. You're going to be fully equipped to serve him, but if you won't, if you're not faithful in this life, so, if we believers are faithless, he, Jesus Christ, will remain faithful to his promise that if we die with him, we will also live with him. That's verse 11. So, if we believers are faithless towards our Lord, by and large, he will nevertheless remain faithful to his promise of eternal life to all who have trusted in him 
alone in him no matter what because he cannot disown or disinherit himself his body once we trust in him alone we become part of his body the body of believers to whom he promised eternal life colossians 1 24. our lord cannot deny eternal life to those who have become part of his body forever the body of christ the body of believers whom he indwells forever the church the believer's unfaithfulness cannot cause God to deny his own work of salvation. So, look at Matthew 10, 32 to 33 and 37 to 39. Losing one's life is losing one's eternal rewards. Matthew 10, 20, 10, 32. Everyone, therefore, who shall confess me before men, I will confess him before my Father who is in heaven. What does that mean? But whoever shall deny me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Charles Bing, Pastor Bing says, The idea of being ashamed of Christ or denying him is clarified in some contexts more than in others. Perhaps the greatest clarification comes from Matthew 10, 32-33, which I just read. There, there Jesus is giving instructions to the twelve before sending them out to preach the gospel. He warns of rejection and persecution and encourages them not to fear. Verses 32 to 33 are also followed by similar warnings about rejection. In verses 32 to 33, Jesus is both encouraging and warning in the face of the fear of persecution. He wants the disciples to know that anyone who identifies with him will be rewarded, while anyone who shrinks from this will be denied by Christ before the Father, which is explained below. Matthew's context seems a close parallel to that which is signified by Mark's phrase in this adulterous and sinful gen generation in Mark 8, 38. So the consequence of facing someone who is ashamed of or denies Christ is more enigmatic. Does Christ's reciprocal shame and denial of that person that is coming denote a denial of salvation? <clears throat> in correlating Matthew 10, 32 to 33 with Matthew 16, 27, it is clear that the issue is, is some kind of recompense for one's works, rewards. Here's Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. Matthew takes care to state that at his coming, Christ will reward each one according to his works. That Jesus makes works the basis of the recompense demands that salvation not be the issue. Let's look at Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Remember, for by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, gift of God, not by works that no one can boast. So, Pastor Bing says also the verb apudesai carries the idea of recompense with no inherent sense of whether it is good or bad. So it could be speak of positive reward or negative judgment. In Mark and Luke is, is a negative re recompense is suggestion because it says, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with all the angels. So those who are too ashamed to identify with Christ will experience Christ's shame. The effect of Christ's shame is not specified, but one would could surmise that for a redeemed and now fully enlightened believer, this would at least produce agonizing regret. And that Matthew 22 is talking about a weeping and gnashing of teeth in the kingdom of God when you realize the loss of rewards and what could have been for your rest of eternity. In the parallel passage, Matthew 10, 32 to 33, the idea of recompense is good. Or, verse 33, bad. Accordingly, Christ's confession or lack of it in heaven would not relate to the judgment of our salvation, but to an acknowledgment of, or lack of it before the Father of the disciples' unity and fellowship with Christ, which is recompensed in an unspecified but appropriate way. However, one might compare 2 Timothy 2.12 with reigning, where reigning with Christ is the specific reward. And you're built to want to do that. You're built with that skill set. Matthew 10, 32 to 33, continued. He who loves the father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and he who does not take the cross up to his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. So take up his cross and follow me, because following another person is a process, a progression that requires time. This condition cannot speak of entrance into heaven. This would promote salvation by the imitation of Christ or by adherence to his example which would be a salvation of works. It is best taken as a term that describes a continuously committed lifestyle. More on this next time.